Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is Matthew Dix, a poker player who recently published an article about the right and wrong way to tell a bad beat story. We're definitely going to talk about that article. And first, a little bit about Matthew. He is arguably the most influential storyteller anywhere. He's won (laughs) multiple dozens of storytelling events. He's written the best-selling book called Story Worthy, which has affected both Richard and my lives. He co-hosts a podcast on storytelling with his lovely wife, hosts numerous classes and other storytelling events, happens to be a personal hero of ours, and we're delighted at having him on the show. Matthew Dix, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Well, thank you. That was that was very generous of you. I, I hope I can live up to it. I hope so, too. Uh, to give an, a listeners an idea of what you do, we've asked you to tell one of your stories that relates to gambling in a way. So, Matthew, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, so, oh, so back in 1992, I'm managing a McDonald's restaurant in Brockton, Massachusetts. I'm 21 years old, and I'm working the night shift. I work the night shift every every night, basically. It's a moment in my life when I'm awaiting trial for a crime I didn't commit. I'm trying to save $25,000 for the legal fees that are required in order to perhaps keep me out of prison. And part of that process is uh, working a day job, oddly enough, at a bank. And at night, I manage this McDonald's restaurant. And so I'm closing up one night, getting everything ready, sort of ready to uh, settle in. And my my uh, employees, Nock and Nam, these two Vietnamese guys that are like five feet tall and four feet wide, they're just these these bricks of muscle. They're in, the, they're in the kitchen, and I hear them shouting, and they're brothers. They're twin brothers. They look exactly alike, and, and they're good. They're good workers. They spend most of the time eating pickles behind my back. They just they eat enormous sums of pickles, and so as I go back into the kitchen to find out what's going on, they're bent over a prep table. They're sort of, uh, they're sort of straddling a prep table, and they're arm wrestling, and they're yelling at each other in Vietnamese as they're arm wrestling, and I haven't seen them do this before, so I ask them what they're doing, and they ignore me. They're so intense in their competition. So this this girl, Frances, says they're arm wrestling to see who has to do the dishes tonight because it's the worst job. You might as well wear a bathing suit if you're doing the dishes because you're just going to end up soaking wet. And so I watch them in this this battle. And it's, I've never seen really anyone arm wrestle like this before. I used to arm wrestle all the time in Boy Scout camp. But this is a this is like a real seemingly professional version of arm wrestling. And it goes on for a little bit. And finally, Nam pins knock and they start screaming at each other. And I tell them to calm down. I say, knock it off, get to work. And I sort of belittle what they were doing. And Knock says, oh, well, why don't you arm wrestle? And, you know, I say, no, like I got work to do. And he says, oh, are you afraid? You know, which is sort of, you know, the Marty McFly in me. If you call me a coward, I, you know, my hackles get up. And, you know, he's huge, this guy. No, this this guy is huge, Knock. Uh, and I'm not huge. You know, I'm basically how I am today, except that back then, because I was working basically all day and all night, and I was sort of atrophying in a lot of ways. The one way I was trying to stay in shape is I'd do push-ups every time I went to the bathroom, and I went to the bathroom a lot, so I'd do 50 push-ups, and I'd be able to do them in an instant. Like, I, I really was kind of strong on the top. And so I said, fine, I'll do it. I'll um, I'll arm wrestle you. So I, I straddle the prep table, and we lock arms, and right away, his grip is, it's like iron. I'm, I'm thinking I'm doomed. And when Nam shouts, go, the first second, I'm sure I'm going to lose. Like, it is incredible how strong this man is. But I managed to hold on. And and we start wrestling. And I realize right away two things. One is I'm never going to beat Nock. There's no way I'm going to get this man's arm over the table. But I realize he, he's not going to get me over either. Like, we're we're dead heated in the middle there. And I don't think I'm ever going to lose. And I don't think Nock is ever going to lose. I kind of feel like we're going to be here forever. That, you know, till the end of days, we will be, you know, in this battle. And then finally, Nam slams his hand on the on the table and says, time. I didn't realize these were being timed. It was a one-minute time. And they start shouting in Vietnamese again, and they're excited this time. 
They're excited because I am a white guy who doesn't look very strong, but apparently can arm wrestle. They're really excited about it. And I say, like, you know, I didn't beat you. And they say, no, 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 that doesn't matter. They explained to me that they are involved in an illegal underground arm wrestling gambling situation that that large numbers of men gather in this place and they arm wrestle and they gamble on on who's going to win. And part of the gambling they explained to me isn't who's going to win or lose, but just they gamble on the 20 second increment, the 40 second increment, the 60 seconds, and then whether it's a pin or not. So people will bet on you even to hold up for 20 seconds. And I don't look like a guy who can hold up for 20 seconds. They say, we're going to make a lot of money on you. And then I tell them, I'm actually left-handed. I play all my sports right-handed because that's the way I was taught. But my left hand is actually stronger than my right. And I had just been arm wrestling with my right hand. And when I say that, they lose their minds. They can't (laughs) believe it. They say, we're going to make a fortune on you. And I'm not sort of into it right away. I'm not really... You know, I'm not really looking to engage in illegal underground arm wrestling, but I am $25,000 in debt and I am making sort of $9 an hour at the bank and $7 an hour at the at the McDonald's. And they point out to me, you're never going to cover your debt. Like the only way you can do it is if you come with us. And it takes some coaxing, but I agree. And they start training me. I, I didn't understand it, but it's a sport and it's got strategy And it's got skill and it's got technique. And so every night they come to the McDonald's, even when they're not working, and they come and they work me out. Every minute that I have, I'm locking arms with Knock or Nom, and they're teaching me about grips, and they're teaching me about strategies, and they're teaching me about feints and all these things that I didn't understand. And and I'm getting better. I'm not getting stronger, but you do get better at this game after a while. And so finally the night comes when I'm going to go to this this tournament. Uh, I get out of work at like 1 o'clock in the morning. And so I don't get there till two o'clock in the morning. And it's this abandoned building. It looks sort of like it could have been a school at one time or a factory. It's just a red brick building that's as dark as dark can be. There's not a single crack of light. But I do what they tell me to do, which is to go in the back and to find these stairs that go down into the basement. And I find the stairs and I come to this iron door. And there's a soup ladle hanging by the iron door on a chain. And I can hear the other side of the door. They're screaming and they're shouting and they're swearing and there's laughing. There's arm wrestling on the other side of this door. And the ladle is here because no one will ever hear you knock. So what knock and Nam told me is you take the soup ladle and you hammer on the door and you keep hammering until someone opens the door. And so I hammer on that door. And after a little while, the door flies open and this enormous man answers it. And he says, what? And I say, I'm here for knock and nom. And he says, oh, come on in. And so I walk into this door and down this this long corridor into this room. And it's a big room. It's got six tables in the room. They're high tops. And they're a little different than what I expected. Knock and nom hadn't explained this to me. They've got a knob or two knobs on each table, one for each man to grip. And they've got this yellow cushion that you put your elbow in. They haven't described any of this to me. And the room is filled with chalk, chalk dust, because they've all got these bags of chalk that they're slapping in their hands to keep their hands dry, I guess. And every single person has a cooler uh, at their feet. It's a serious BYOB situation. Everyone has brought something to drink, and they drag it around the room in these little coolers. And I'm the only white guy in the room. Uh, It is almost exclusively Vietnamese guys and a few black guys. And I'm definitely the smallest guy in the room, too. And I find Nak and Nam, and they say it's going to take an hour before we can get a table. So go stand over there. And so I stand on the side of the wall, and at first I just want to leave. Like, this is crazy. There's 50 guys in here, and they're screaming, and they're yelling, and most of them don't speak English. So I'm not really sure what's happening. But as I'm standing on the wall watching, I start to eventually see the sport again, what I've been taught. Once I can see through the chalk dust and the coolers and the mayhem that is generally going on, I start to see all the things that Nak and Nam have taught me. And I start to see these guys arm wrestling and using the techniques that that Nakanam have spent a month teaching me. And I start to feel a little better about what is going down. And so after an hour, Nakanam come over and they say, we have a table now. All you have to do is wrestle. We're going to do all the gambling. And we've made a deal. We've made a deal, Nakanam, that I don't have to front any money, that they're going to front me my share of the money. And if somehow we lose all our money, I can pay them back slowly because they know my financial situation. I'm living like in a room. 
I'm sharing a room with a goat, literally a goat and another man in an army cot off the kitchen. Like, they know that I am not in a situation that I can bring $500 to this place, which is what they brought. They're going to be using $500 to gamble on this night. And so I go over to the table, and it is a huge man. He is enormous. But I realize he's really no bigger than Nakanam, other than in height. And uh, he's not nice. Like, he, he doesn't. He doesn't have the same smile that Nak and Nam have when we arm wrestle. So for a moment, I'm intimidated. And there's referees, it turns out, at these games, too. But you can't see them because they look like everybody else. There's no referee uniform. There's just a. It turns out there's a guy at each table who's sort of monitoring things. And there's another guy who's collecting the money and taking the bets. And it's all being done in Vietnamese, so I don't understand any of it. I just wait until Nak and Nam tell me to put my elbow in the yellow pad. And when I do, the man clasps my hand, and it is like iron again. And uh, Nock whispers to me, he says, you can do this. You only need to hold it for 20 seconds. That is the bet this time. And so we're off. It's a three, two, one, go. And I go 20 seconds, and then I go 40 seconds, and then I go 60 seconds. And I would never in my life have been able to pin that man, but he doesn't pin me. There's a part of arm wrestling that is absolutely strength and technique, but there is also a part of arm wrestling, a real part, that is just will. It is the decision that I am going to suffer the pain that is required to not be pinned. And I've always been that kind of person. I've always been sort of the jackass that w is willing to do anything to make someone else's life difficult, no matter what it is. And that is what I'm doing on this night. I am making life difficult for these guys. And when they lose to me, everyone laughs at them because I am the skinny white guy in the room. I am the guy who should not be winning. And we make a lot of money for about an hour. And then I switch to my left hand. Knock and Nam say, I bet he can even beat you left-handed. And all the bets are doubled, and all the competitors line up again. And because I'm left-handed, I manage to hold my own. I don't pin a single person that night. I don't come close to pinning a single man, but I am not pinned at all. And we leave that night with an enormous amount of money. And I leave that night deciding I need to come back and do this again. Now, Knock and Nam explained to me, we will never make this much money again that sort of the cat is out of the bag and there is one game in town and that is the game and we can return and there's absolutely guys who are so macho that they will want to they will want to beat me and they will try to beat me and we can continue to earn a profit but the profit that we made on that night will never be matched again that this was the one special night where we made an enormous amount of money and it's true i go back a few more times and we never come close to making the same amount of money i am i'm a known quantity i am the white guy who can't beat anybody, but who can't be beaten. And that's not a great title to have, but it's um, better than the guy who can be beaten. And so uh, so that is my history of underground, illegal arm wrestling competition. <laughs> <laughs> I like that story. Yeah. back You know, back in the early 90s, I think I made this movie a couple of times, except back then it was kickboxing instead of uh, arm wrestling. <laughs> the underground uh, fighting, gambling, yeah. Yeah, it was good times. I mean, I'm glad I did it. I don't think I would do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be talking about this Bad Beat Story article that you wrote, but let's first focus on the story we just heard. Like, what makes this a interesting story? Um, there's things called stakes. There's things called feelings. So, if what would make this like I don't I don't really give a damn about arm wrestling, but I was fascinated by this story. So, what is it? What are the secrets of this story? Briefly, to a non-storytelling audience, that makes it interesting. Sure, you know it's an interesting version of the story too. The original version I tell is very much tied into uh, PTSD, which I suffer from. Uh, just the fact of going through that iron door that night was sort of impossible for me because of some things that happened to me. But, you know, one of the things we do as storytellers is we we sort of tell the story that we want to tell depending on the audience. And I don't think your audience is into the pathos of PTSD. They don't need to hear that um, on a gambling podcast. But, you know, a lot of the things do remain in this version of the story. First is, I mean, there are stakes in the story. There are real stakes. And it's not sort of a win-lose situation. It's a guy who's who's in a bad spot. You know, I'm in debt, $25,000 for something that was not my doing. 
and I need to get out of it. And instantly that kind of a stake is going to connect to a lot of people because we've all been in situations where we're sort of stuck and it's not really our doing, but we need to find a way to get out of it. And so just the idea of, is he going to do it? Is he not going to do it? You know, I'm a person who you get to root for in the story because I'm certainly not a, you know, I'm not a hero in the story and I don't actually present myself at the end as a winner, right? I'm a guy who basically can tie in some <laughs> arm wrestling matches, right? So, you know, I don't like to tell stories where I'm sort of the the winner at the end or the champion. So I like this story a lot because I'm sort of pretty neutral at the end with the exception of making some money and getting closer to to paying off that debt. You know, the other things that are important, Nock and Nam are uh, important characters in the story, and, and they're pretty likable people, and uh, I want you to like them. They mean a lot to me. I have some interesting... Uh, there's some interesting sort of suspenseful moments where things are sort of like confusing. I love the fact that the ladle is by the door, for example. You know, one of the things that we do as storytellers is we present something and we want to create some wonder. So the fact that I mentioned that there's an iron door and there's a ladle hanging on a chain by the door, I don't immediately explain to you what the system is, why that ladle is there. Uh, and I do that on purpose. I want people to sort of wonder about the ladle. And the great thing is either they can't figure out why the ladle's there, and when the when the explanation is given, they go, oh, aha, uh -huh. or they sort of figure it out. And then what they do is they get that great confirmation from the storyteller that their guess was correct. And that also feels great to people. That's actually a dopamine hit when you make a prediction and then that prediction comes out to be true. I mean, it's part of gambling really is, right? You're trying to decide whether the guy's bluffing or not, and if you are correct, uh, not only do you get his chips, but you get that great hit of dopamine that makes you feel good. So I do a lot of those tricks in that story to sort of to sort of, you know, keep you wondering about what is going to happen next. But mostly it's about attaching you to me in a meaningful way and presenting stakes that are not just is he going to win the arm wrestling match, but he's a guy who's stuck in a difficult situation. He's a guy who's being ushered into a foreign situation, a situation he's never experienced before, a potentially frightening or at least nerve wracking situation. And I find my way through it. And I just think people connect to that because we're all in those situations from time to time. Wow. <laughs> um, for some reason, you're our storytelling hero. Maybe people can figure that out. So let's switch it to poker. A lot of our audience talks about poker. So how'd you get started? How good did you get? And are you still playing? Uh, well, I started with a home game. You know, I, I, back in 1992, I made a list. I didn't, re I don't remember doing this, but I made a list of my hopes for the future. And one of the list, one of the items on the list was to have a regular home poker game. My friend actually made the list for me and then told me about it a couple of years ago. He goes, you know, you achieved a lot of those things you wrote down in 1992. I said, I have no recollection of what you're talking about. But, so, but I'd wanted to play poker for a while. It intrigued me. Uh, I started playing, gosh, probably just before I got married, maybe, or no, well before I got married. So maybe 2002-ish, you know, sort of around there. Uh, I started with a home game, started playing with my buddies. I just said, I want to play poker. It was on TV. You know, Chris Moneymaker had, um, he had just won the WSOP or was on the verge of doing it. So it was sort of exploding in the world. Uh, I bought all the books. I read all the books. I still have the books. They're literally at my feet right now in a bin. I don't read them anymore, um, although I should go back. And uh, I played with my buddies, and I proved to be very good in the home game. Like People did not beat me. And so then I started playing online on PokerStars, and I played really well there. I, I earned enough to pay off my honeymoon. Uh, I earned enough to pay for uh, you know, a tens of thousands of dollars surgery with my dog. I, I earned a lot of money playing on PokerStars. It was a was a good profitable way to spend some time and then uh you know when when everything got shut down sadly uh i made sort of a cost benefit analysis i could still find places to play sort of or offshore you know in ways that were not exactly legal based upon where i was living but it was doable but i at that point with uh less players in the world you know everyone seemed to be much better you know if you were playing offshore you were probably a good player so it was a harder it was harder to earn you know, per hour, my my per hour earnings went down. And I just did a benefit analysis on whether writing or poker playing made more sense for me in terms of profit. And um, the writing turned out to be much more profitable. I've published many books since then. But I still love the game. I still play the game regularly. I have a regular home game right now. We, we literally play on Zoom. 
with a poker app on our phone. I stream Spotify into the Zoom room so we can listen to music. We exchange money via Venmo. It's not as good as, you know, having eight or ten guys around my table once a week, but but we make and do. So uh, so I got pretty good. I mean, I, I, I would go to the casino at Foxwoods, and I was a regular winner. I'll never forget the first time I went to the Foxwoods Casino, my wife had like a baby shower at the house, and so I went down and played in the poker room. And when I came back, she said, how did you do? And I said, I did well. I made nine seventy five. And she thought it was $9.75. And then <laughs> when she, she saw the kitchen table, she saw this pile of cash. And she said, what's that? And I said, I told you, I made almost a grand. And she said, you made almost a grand? You were there like three hours. And I said, I know, I hit a couple big hands. And she said, when are you going back? <laughs> so, you know, she was a supporter. On our wedding night, on our wedding night, my father-in-law asked Alicia, she said, does Matt have a gambling problem? Because he seems to be doing this a lot. And she said... He doesn't have a gambling problem. He paid for our trip to Bermuda. We're going nine days to Bermuda, and he paid for it with poker winnings. He's not having a gambling problem. It is not a problem at all. I like it when he plays. And then she explained to him that poker really isn't gambling. It's a game of skill. I don't know if he he ever came around to that, but uh, my wife is smart enough to come around to it. So so that's sort of you know how it went for me. That um. You you were fortunate there. Bob and I have talked about often on the show how difficult it was dating when you got to this we got to this conversation of i'm a professional gambler and immediately they think you have a problem and you're an alcoholic and i would try to explain to them it's it's not like um i'm an alcoholic it's it's like i own a liquor store and i make money off every bottle that goes over the counter you know but right it um it it took a long time to meet um my wife, who understood from the beginning, you know, that this is a business and uh, one of the reasons I married her. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I invested in the market. I'm a regular investor in the stock market. I spent five years studying it before I ever invested a penny. But I tell people it's not very different than poker. You know, it is very much like becoming knowledgeable, understanding how things work, doing the math. You are gambling when you invest in the stock market just as much as you're gambling when you invest in a hand and you put chips in a pot and, uh, you know, it's, it tends to be the person who does the most, you know, work and does the most study that does the best. And I'm doing great in the market too, but it, it is, a if poker is gambling, then the market is gambling too. And a lot of people are gambling their 401ks in the market. Now you recently got a gig, a writing gig at poker stars. I did. How did that happen? Uh, someone at Poker Stars read my book, Storyworthy, and um, listened to my podcast and had no idea that I was a poker player. They they simply wanted me to be Matt the Storyteller. Can you uh, tell us how to tell a good bad beat? And they tried to explain to me what a bad beat was, and I said, I, I know what a bad beat is. I'm good on that. <laughs> and so they had no idea that I had been playing on their platform. They had no idea that I was a poker player. It was just, it was, um, you know, very uh, serendipity, I guess. Yeah. But it was great. I was so excited because, I mean, the chips I have in the other room are Poker Star chips that, you know, were given to me because I played so often on Poker Stars. They shipped me a set of chips one day. So, you know, I have very, very fond memories of playing on that platform and hope again to do so someday. So I was thrilled to see their email come across the transom. But now this was not a one off thing, right? You're going to be a regular writer there. Uh, I don't know. I, that's not my real understanding. I, oh. you know, I, it's, it's been suggested that I might write future things, but I'm not going to be a regular columnist of any kind. But I was thrilled to do what I did. It was it was fun, actually, you know, to, to think about how to tell people, especially people that aren't interested in storytelling, but interested in poker, you know, how to tell that bad beat story. That was a lot of fun to sort of figure out. So what makes wire? poker bad beat stories usually so bad well usually you know they're they're about things that people don't care about or things that are not extraordinary which is i lost some chips because because probability unfortunately ran into ran into me and i lost my chips right ultimately most bad beat stories are only about cards and chips you know if i had told my arm wrestling story and the entire story had been predicated on does Matt win the arm wrestling match, it's not really that interesting of a story. Until you find out sort of what's going on in my life, the you know, the stakes behind the arm wrestling match, uh, that story isn't very exciting either. So most people, their bad beat stories tend to really just be examples of 
I ran into bad probability and I want to tell you about it so I can feel a little bit better about it when you say something to me like, oh, that was bad luck, right? We're really just looking for someone to tell us we made the right call and got screwed by the numbers, you know? So that's not really a story anyone ever wants to hear. You know, that's the equivalent of what did you have for dinner, right? Everyone has dinner and nobody wants to hear what it was. So, you know, it, it can't just be I played a hand. The numbers say I should have won it most of the time, but this one time I didn't. That's essentially what most bad beat stories are, and that is not really a story. It's a it's a cry fest. So how do we turn it around? Well, if you want to tell a good one, first of all, I always say, how many do you have? Because if you have more than half a dozen, you probably have too many, right? You, you just can't tell that many. It's like drinking stories. I have the same rule for drinking stories. If you have more than half a dozen good drinking stories, you, you have a problem. And you probably don't have very many good stories. So the bad beat story can't just be about cards and chips. You know, we say in poker that we play the man, right? We don't play the cards. We don't play the chips. And that's what the, the bad beat story has to be about. It has to be, in some way, something beyond chips and cards. In the best version of the bad beat story, a poker, a non-poker player can listen to the story and really like it because it isn't about actually the, the mechanics and the numbers that are happening on the table. It's about, it's about something that people can connect to. It is about your self-worth. It is about your reputation. It's, it's about whether you achieved a milestone or you failed to achieve a milestone it's, it's whether your enemy got the best of you on that day or you know that your friend ruined your day it has to be something that people can generally relate to that is not based entirely on chips and cards so you know if your bad beat story is just chips and cards it's not really a great story but if you happen to be losing to a guy that you can't stand or it happens to be the match that's going to get you into the, you know, the satellite that's going to get you into the WSOP and it's your life's dream. And it's either going to be a yes or a no, uh, you know, at the end of the, at the end of the story, that's good. You know, the other thing you can really help your story with is by not telling people it's a bad beat story at the onset of the story. Cause once you say, you're not going to believe the bad beat I had, you've essentially told the story. All you have left now is some details to fill in but we know what the story is. I mean, one of the most delightful things a storyteller can ever offer an audience is surprise. That that amazing feeling when something happens that you never saw coming and yet somehow feels inevitable when it happens. And so often people strip away all the surprise in their stories by saying something like, you're not going to believe the bad beat I just suffered. Right at that point, there can be no surprise because you've already told us how the end is going to be. So instead of saying, you're not going to believe the bad beat story, I, the bad beat I just suffered, you should say, you're not going to believe the hand I just played, or you're not going to believe what just happened at the table, or I played poker last night, you're not going to believe what just took place, or even just let me tell you what happened at the poker table. Now we have lots of opportunity for surprise. So it, it's it's turning a, bit, uh, a story about chips and cards into something more meaningful and something that extends beyond the table. So in your in this article on poker stars you tell us about sweeney who is this nice guy but you really hate him because of blah 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 yes. how does that how does why is that important well first of all i'll tell you he read the article the other day yeah. <laughs> and he loved it. he's like this is me you're right his name is really feeny um so i switched him to sweeney it, the, it's important to know who my opponent is because in my bad beat story, the one at least I present in the in the article, he's the kind of guy you never want to lose to. He's definitely not a good poker player. He doesn't really understand the game that well. But he's also sort of this publicity hog. He's constantly looking for ways to get attention and never through the right way. I'm always telling him, make something that people will enjoy. You know, write something or record something or go do something in the world that will make a difference, that will get the attention that you so desperately want. And so often he's saying, can you retweet my tweet? You know, like that's going to make a difference. Or, you know, can you videotape this pot? Because if it goes in, I'm going to put it on IG and it's going to be epic. You know, he's just, he's a nightmare. He's a, he's a, he's a wonderful person with a good heart, but his um, methods are horrendous. And so I know that if I lose to him, I'm never going to hear the end of it, and he's going to use it 
and ways to self-publicize at my expense. And so it's not just a bad beat story where I'm going to lose chips to another player. I'm going to lose chips to like the worst person in the world to lose chips to. And so, you know, knowing who he is is extremely important in the story. I lose, you know, I had a bad beat a couple of weeks ago with my buddy Sam, but I have no beef with Sam. He's a good guy. I love him. We, we play poker. We're probably we're probably the two guys at the table most evenly matched. So I have no bad beat story with Sam because I have no beef with him. There's nothing wrong with Sam. He's, he's one of the best people I know. Losing to him, just that's just numbers and cards and chips. So Sweeney is a story and Sam is not. And then you forget about Sweeney in the story, but at the end you bring him back. Why is that important? Why is what important? Why is you forget about it? You introduce him, yeah. then you go and talk about some other stuff, and then you come back to Sweeney again. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I don't know how purposeful that was. I mean, I guess because Sweeney is important because he's the last person I want to lose to. Uh, but you have to, I guess, understand a little bit about me, too. You know, it can't be a story about Sweeney. It has to be a story about me. And so, obviously, he's going to come in the end because he beats me, you know, in a way that is really frustrating, where he doesn't know the hand he has, right? He he puts his hand down thinking he lost, and one of my buddies points out to him that he won, which is the worst, you know, for especially for a guy like this. Uh, but you also have to understand stakes in the story. You have to understand me. So, you know, Sweeney gets introduced as like the bad guy up front, the understanding that this is a jerk who I'm going to have to play with. But you also have to know me to a certain degree, too, before the things can play out. You know, again, we play the man in poker and you have to do the same thing in storytelling. We have to know who the people are. It's really important to understand their motivations and, you know, what they want and what they don't want. And, um, you know, sometimes what their past is and how their past is informing the present, all of those kinds of things. So but I found my oh, – I'll, I'll let you go, Richard. I've been hogging this so far. <laughs> well, I just wanted to – so you um, are a full-time teacher. You've written six, seven, eight books, uh, and you're out doing storytelling things and consulting and then also teaching classes in storytelling. Uh a, how do you how, how many hours are there in your day? And <laughs> and B, um, if if online poker were to come back in your state, would you go back to playing poker, or or would you no longer have time to fit that in? Right. So I'll, I would play for sure. I mean, I guess if it just came back to con to my state, like Connecticut, let's say, there might not be enough players to to make it something I'd seek profitable. You know pursuits. I would certainly be playing it for fun still. I, I don't know if I'd be playing it in that professional way uh, that I used to when there was plenty of players out there and plenty of money to be had. In terms of how I get stuff done, I'm actually writing a book about it right now. It's the question I get asked the most in my life. There's a million ways to answer that question, which is why I'm writing the book. But I think a lot of times it boils down to the idea that as much as people may say that time is a commodity, their most valuable commodity, they never treat it in that way. Uh, most people don't actually make very active decisions about the way they will spend their time. Now, most people are like water, frankly, which is they just follow the path of re least resistance. And so what happens is they tend to look at 15 minute increments as useless, and then they waste those 15 minute increments. And they tend to do things like, they eat dinner at five and by seven they're in front of the television till 11. And not that I'm opposed to television. I, I sort of love television to an enormous degree, but when I'm making decisions, I'm always thinking about my decision-making not based upon what I want right now. Cause if I, if, if I only did that, I would just have sex and eat cheeseburgers all the time. That's essentially <laughs> the only few things I need to do to be happy. But instead I'm always thinking about, well, when I'm a hundred years old, how does that 100-year-old version of me, if he could look at me right now, how would he want me to spend my time, right? And he would probably say, listen, if you want to sit down with your wife and spend 45 minutes watching a TV show, that's fine. But work on that book that you're working on and do some studying on that new thing that you're trying to learn and spend some time with your kids, for God's sake. And, you know, work on that company that you're trying to build. Like, do those things. And that's what I do. I constantly make decisions, not based upon what I actually want right now, but what my future version of me desires. And that's why I, uh, that's why I exercise, frankly, 
I don't, you know, quite often I don't want to get on the bike and ride 10 miles, you know, especially when it's cold out or when it's raining out. But I do it because the 100 year old version of me says, you better do it because trust me, you're going to be in terrible shape. You're not going to be able to do anything soon if you don't get your ass out of the chair and exercise. And so we make some decisions like that. We, we make some active decisions about the way we spend our time. I am just incredibly aggressive about the decisions that I make. And I use my time uh, like it is the most precious thing I have. Very good. We're going to take a brief break now uh, for a commercial break. And then we're going to return to Matthew Dix. We have a lot more question, including some more about the Bad Beat article. The South Point has more than 10,000 gains, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. In November, the promotion is half price Amazon or Walmart cards. Normally, you can use 8,334 points for $25 in cash or free play. This month, you earn and redeem this many points for a $50 gift card. In the past, there were there was a limit of 10 cards per person per month. This time, the limit is 12. Assuming you value the gift cards the same as cash, this means for the first $100,000 coin in in November, you have a 0.6 slot club instead of 0.3. On Thanksgiving Day, there's a hot seat promotion where $100 in free play goes to a player every three minutes starting at 8 a.m. This is only worth a buck or two an hour on average. But if you still have some play to do to get your gift cards, doing it when you get the extra bonus makes sense. At predicted.org, there's a market where you can place small bets on the occurrence of various political happenings, mostly but not entirely in the United States. Now, the election is over, and most of the markets have been decided or at a price of 99 cents, which means uh, you, you can't make any money on them, but there are still some up to grabs, uh, including whether or not you think the recounts will be successful, who cabinet members are going to be, and such. Gamblers with an Edge listeners receive a one-time offer of a deposit match up to $20 at predicted.org slash promo slash edge. You must play the money through once and cannot withdraw it for 30 days. Blackjackapprenticeship.com is an excellent site for those of you who wish to be successful at counting cards of blackjack. Free video posted about a year ago on YouTube with the fastest way to memorize basic strategy. As a video poker player, I realized a similar system could be used to master my game. There are a number of additional videos posted behind the paywall for members only. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, you'll get correction on most of the games. The game of the week is Powerhouse Poker. This is a 10 coins per line game where you get, ex you get dealt extra hands, some with multipliers, when you're dealt a paying combination. For example, if you're dealt two pair, you may be given hands, and four of them have multipliers from 4x to 8x. How many extra hands you get and how big the multipliers are varies from game to game. The extra hands start from the same position and same hold as you made. Let's say you're dealt two pair, queens and fives, in a game where it's correct to hold two pair and not just the queens. Should you decide to only hold the queens, as many players incorrectly do, the extra hands will all start from holding a pair of queens. The game always returns more than the five-coin version of the same pay schedule, and no strategic variations are necessary in order to play the game accurately. All right, we are back with Matthew Dix. Uh, on your story for Poker Stars, I found myself Ask wanting is one thing that you didn't resolve in my mind. Uh, in your bad beat story with Sweeney, uh, somebody else at the table told him that he won the hand basically after he conceded. Had that other person not spoken up, would you have spoken up? 
No, absolutely not. <laughs> Nor should the person at the table have spoken up. And frankly, I should have just taken that pot and explained to Sweeney that, you know, you declared your hand to be this, and that is what your hand is, and I win the pot. But because we were at a friendly game, it's friendly enough that I will allow that to take place, but it is not so friendly that I would help someone like him uh, decode his hand accurately. Uh, he, he, if he fails in that regard, uh, that is on him. So, no, I would not have told him. But thankfully for him, my friend pointed it out. <laughs> I fall out your friend for interfering. I did not. It's a friendly game. You know, it, it's a funny game because it, it's one of those games where a lot of people root against me. You know, I, in life, actually, oddly enough, I tend to be the clown. I'm the one that sort of, you know, hits the worst tee shot ever known to man and, you know, runs into the worst luck ever known to man. So I'm typically the person who is the foil anyway. So people are often rooting for me. On that night, they really wanted Sweeney to beat me because they knew how much pain it would cause me and how long term that pain would be, you know, if I I had lost. So, so no, it's a friendly game and, you know. He knew better. My buddy knew better than to than to do that, but uh, he also knew how much it would hurt me. I have played in uh, many home uh, games. It's good to have friends like that. It really is. I know. It's, it's joy. <laughs> the, um, so Richard and I know you. Uh, we were recommended the book Story Worthy uh, by a friend we both value. And Story Worthy is primarily about crafting and telling true stories. Uh largely about telling them at the Moth, which is an organization where true stories are told. Now, the major feature is they are true, but poker, on the other hand, deception is a highly valued rather than the truth. In your opinion, is there any place for fiction in a well-told bad beat story? Oh, what an interesting question. I, I, I have to say no, just because I just, I'm a very, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big lover of the truth in these stories. I don't tell the whole truth. I always make that clear to people that, you know, the best storytellers, we don't add anything into a story that didn't already exist, but I will conveniently remove things in order to help the story along, you know, not to make myself look better, but sort of to clear the field of people who don't have any relevance to the story or to I'll manipulate time, you know, if, if something happened on a Tuesday and the next thing happens on a Wednesday, but they essentially could have happened on the same day, I'll squish them into the same day for, for ease of telling and ease of understanding. But, you know, I'm a fiction writer as well. I write novels, and that's where I make everything up. I like storytelling, you know, bad beat stories or any other kind of story, because it's like a puzzle. I'm, like, plagued by the truth. I have a certain number of facts that I have to play with and I have to decide which ones to use, which ones not to use, which order to put them in and then how to present them. And I kind of love that. So for for me, adding something that didn't actually happen, you know, adding fiction to my nonfiction is not something I would ever think of doing just because I get to play in that sandbox when I'm when I'm writing my fiction already. So uh, so I separate the two. I'm pretty I'm pretty strict about it. Many of our listeners are blackjack players and sometimes do not want to reveal their true identity because among other things, it helps casinos to kick them out. Yeah. In your opinion, would a study of storytelling assist them in finding ways to keep their identity secret? Huh? Well, I mean, I, I don't think I know enough about it. I don't know how they keep their identity a secret. Uh, but if they need to be other people, you know, if they need to present themselves as other people in some way, then storytelling can certainly help you because uh, in that case, I guess lying is going to be very helpful to you. <laughs> well, it, it's actually an interesting conundrum because, um, you know, I've been faced with this for 40 years. So um, it's it's really a weird kind of storytelling because for a couple of reasons. Um, you want to do the opposite of normal storytelling because you don't want to be the guy remembered. So you want your yeah. story to be as uninteresting as possible. No suspense, <laughs> not funny, the most boring, you know, uh, I, people, often I would, when 
uh, being grilled by a pit boss, you know, what do you do for a living? You want something that's going to make him go away quickly. And I would say something like, oh, I sell life insurance. You know, are your loved ones taken care of? And that would send them scurrying away very quickly. You know, no one wants to talk to a life insurance salesman. So, so um so it's so the opposite of what I teach. You have to take all of my principles and reverse them. Exactly. Yes, exactly <laughs> right. Well, spies do that too, don't they? The spies sure. want to be unremembered. <laughs> right. Right? So you want to go in there and be as forgettable as possible. Exactly. So, yep. Yep. so, yeah, don't be a storyteller. I mean, be the opposite. <laughs> be, be the bad storytellers who come to my workshop who <laughs> don't know what the hell they're doing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so... um you have won more than 50 of these moth events and some moth super events as well. Richard and I have each won one. Congratulations. And, uh, That's fantastic. Oh, and you, you helped uh, in more ways than one. First of all, your book is, is key. But on October 27th, um, Richard did it in uh, San Francisco, which is also called Northern California. Now, you entered that particular event, and you paid your $10 plus fees to be a storyteller. And your name was called to be um, a storyteller. There were like 40 people, not that many, 20 people's name in the hat. Yours was one of the called, and for whatever reason, you couldn't make it that night. Yeah. And, and Richard got called. Uh, third, which made him the second storyteller, and he went on to win. Uh, now, you don't always win when you're called, but you have a damn good average. So had you been there, Richard might still be waiting for his first. Which is uh, much harder now that they've stopped doing the virtual slams uh, until February or something. So, Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a – I've done the virtual slams. I've won a few of them, but uh, I, I really love the um, – the real the the live events are the things that I love a lot. So I heard that the that the virtual events were being called off for a little while, and you know I was sad for my friends. I love going to those just to see my friends, you know, my New York and Boston friends who I don't see right now at all. I get to see them in those slams, and I got to tell stories all over the country, which was great. I expanded my you know the, my audience, the people who are aware of me, and it's nice to go to like you know I've I've gone to shows virtually and people knew me, you know, even though I. You know, even though I've never been to Florida, you know, Miami, lots of people in that slam happen to know who I was just through storytelling. So all that was good. Um, the live ones are a lot better, though. But, yeah, I'm I'm happy to have uh, helped you out by not showing up. Uh, yeah, thank uh, you. What I doing, you know, what I was doing at the time was I was just basically uh, buying tickets to, you know, six or eight of those slams per month, knowing I wasn't going to be able to go to six or eight, but happy to support that organization a little bit too, you know, knowing I was making a donation to a certain degree, but just allowing myself the freedom of popping in, you know, if my kids are in bed or my kids are, you know, a lot of it is dependent on what is going on in my house at the moment this slam is sort of starting or not. And it would be a game time decision, but I, it was nice to be able to do that because when I do slams here, live it is two and a half hours to new york or it's an hour and a half to boston just to put my name in a hat and possibly get called so so there is some benefits to being in your pajamas and telling a story at a slam <laughs> it's not something i ever expected to do uh so there's i guess there are some silver linings but congratulations to both of you that's fantastic well and some people were entering two or three a night uh they might enter one in louisville and then one in uh the Midwest, Chicago, maybe, and then one in Seattle and oh. be there in all three time zones. And so one guy <laughs> in particular is probably caught up with you number wise. But when you can get four or five victories in a week, it's not the same as when you have to drive an hour and a half each way. Right. Well, I hope he's telling different stories, too. You know, I've never told the same story and nor should you really. It's uh, I have heard. Um, this, well, you know who I'm talking about, but I, uh, I've heard him tell 10 stories on the 10 times I've heard him tell a story. There've been 10 different stories. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I've never yeah. heard him repeat. That's great. Yeah. Very good. So story worthy has meant a lot to Richard. Are you going to do an update on story worthy and how is that coming? It is coming. I was working on it literally this afternoon. Uh, Storyworthy 2, Return of the Story. They will not be the title. 
Uh, but yeah, it's um, it's more than half done. You know, there's part of the new book centers on the idea that storytelling can be very healing and informing to people. You know, something that I always knew, but it never expressed because it felt a little too earthy, crunchy. You know, a little too soft and fluffy. But as I started to teach people, I started to realize that people were experiencing the same thing I was, which is you start to tell your stories and you start to think about your life through the lens of a storyteller, things start to make a lot of sense. And, you know, things that have plagued you and things that have bothered you and issues that you're not even aware that you were sort of dealing with, they can sort of, they can be recognized, they can be you can contend with them, and, and a lot of times you can sort of put them away, which is what I have done through storytelling with a lot of the things that I have dealt with in my life. In crafting a story about it, so many good things can happen, and uh, you can start to really see your life in a different way. So a lot of the book is about that, and then a lot of the book is the techniques that had to come out of the first book, because you know, in publishing, one of the tricky things is after you exceed a certain number of pages, the binding has to change on a book, and then the, the profit margin all, you know, change. And so quite often with at least three of my books that I've written, the publisher has come back to me and said, can we take 15 pages off this book? Because we can we can just make a lot more money if it's 15 pages fewer. And so there were chapters that sort of got, you know, left on the cutting room floor of Storyworthy that will now be put in the new book. So it's, you know, it's probably 50 percent real hardcore craft and 50 percent sort of why you need to be doing this especially for the folks that don't tell stories at the moth or don't plan on telling stories on the stage or don't use storytelling in their professions. I think everyone should be sort of engaged in this process, regardless of who you are, whether you have no one to speak to. You know, so often the person we tell stories to the most is ourselves. That is the first audience we have when we're thinking of our stories and we're thinking about our lives. And we don't treat ourselves like that. We don't treat our, we don't treat ourselves as the audiences that we really are. And so Part of the book is that it's to get people who don't plan on taking a stage to think about storytelling in a new way as well. But I'm excited about it. I'm I'm plowing ahead and trying to get it done. I had to be honest. I have two books under contract right now. The storytelling book is not one of them. So I should really be working on the two books that are under contract that have actual deadlines. But I'm trying to just get this storytelling book put to bed before I do the things that I'm supposed to be doing. Well, my hundred year old self wants you to finish that book, so yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people that feel that way, so and that makes me <laughs> happy. You know. I just finished a chapter today. A chapter I struggled with for a week. Uh I just finished it today and I am A I'm whole excited. week. Yeah. I have written so many books, I've had a lot longer than week long blocks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just one of those chapters where I knew what I had to say and I could not figure out the best ways to say it. And so often in the book, in this book that I'm writing and in Storyworthy, the first one, it was a matter of choosing the right story so often, you know, like I need to explain this technique. Now, how am I going to give them an example? And is it going to be one of my stories? Am I going to choose a story from a storyteller I've worked with before? You know, what is the best choice here? And then how do I tell that story in a way that doesn't go on for 14 pages, you know, sort of summarize the story. So it feels like you heard a story, even though you only really heard a summary of a story. Those are all the things I'm fighting with all the time. If any of our audience wanted to get in touch with you, what would be the best way? Oh, well, if they go to my website, MatthewDix.com, or they email me at MatthewDix at gmail.com, I'm very available. <laughs> I'm easy to find, and, uh, you know, there's lots of stuff on the Internet, as my students recently found out. Like, you have a YouTube channel. <laughs> I heard one of my students say, one of my students said to another student, he has 1,200 subscribers on his YouTube channel. He's rich. <laughs> Uh, we will have links, by the way, we will have links to all of those things in the show notes. Um, so to your page and your author page and your uh, – and the article at Poker Stars and all of this. Yeah. Thank you. So, so at the end of our show, we have a recommended section that we actually stole from Matthew Dix's uh, podcast. So, uh, Richard, what do you have to recommend – to our audience today. Uh, yeah, my recommended this week is a show on Netflix called Queen's Gambit. Um, oh. It's taken from a book by Walter Tevis, who wrote The Hustler, um, which, for my money, is the greatest gambling movie ever made. Um, so, uh, and, and again, it's about someone who is world class at something, but 
deeply flawed individual. In this case, it's a woman chess player. In The Hustler, it's a male pool player. Anyway, uh, there's only seven episodes. They were really great. I binged through all of them in a matter of a couple of days uh, and really enjoyed it. So that's my recommendation. And actually, while I'm at it, I would also recommend you go pick up the Walter Tevis books and, and read those. Oh, that you know, I, I'm listening to that. I'm watching that show right now. My wife has um, gone ahead and watched it without me, so I'm trying to catch up to her. But I didn't realize it was based upon a book, so that's exciting. Yep. So, Matthew, while you have the microphone, do you have anything to recommend to our audience? Yes, I, I'm actually I'll recommend a poker book that I, I've been reading. I haven't read a poker book in a very long time, but my friend Sam, who I mentioned before, he pointed me to a book because he read the Poker Stars article and he said, you know, I think you'd really like this. It's not necessarily so much a strategy book. There is some strategy in it. It's called Best Hand Ever Played, the 52 Winning Poker Lessons from the World's Greatest Players. It's probably 15 years old, but it's still available on Amazon. And it's essentially... It's 52 players of the 52 players you would expect to be there. You're going to know all the names, but it's a two or three page chapter for each one of them, which sort of gives you how did they get their start in poker? How did they learn about it? And then they talk about the best hand they've ever played. And then the book tries to glean some wisdom from that hand, which oftentimes I feel is a little forced, like, all right, just let me enjoy the hand and take from it what I will. But it's been a lot of fun to read because it's one of those books that you can pick up. You can read three people's, you know, histories and then put it down for a while and then come back to it. So as I'm sitting under the trees with my students every day, trying to stay outside as often as possible, because that's the safest place for us to be during this virus. It's one of those books I bring out every day and I read a couple, couple chapters. I read the Daniel Negrano chapter today and um, read about the best hand he ever played. So it's very good. I bet if they took your course, they would tell that story about their best hand better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I actually, I agree with you. I think they would, yes. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Matthew, you are a, his, you are a uh, hero of both Richard and mine. This has been a real pleasure for us. Thank you. And thank you, Richard. And go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. <laughs> good day. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun.